Hit subscribe, become part of our crew, and let's explore the wonders of math together. So the first question is, using the calculator otherwise, calculate the exact value of 1 and 4 sevenths plus 2 divided by 3, or 2 thirds, minus 1 and 5 sixths. So first step is to convert those mixed numbers to improper fractions. Now, the mixed numbers are those with a whole number portion. So a whole number part and a fractional part. So to convert it, we're going to multiply the whole number by the denominator, then add that product to the numerator. So 1 times 7 is 7, plus 4. That's give us 11. So we're going to put that 11 numerator over the current denominator. Put back the 2 thirds, since we don't have a whole number portion. Put back the minus sign. 1 times 6 is 6 plus 5, that's 11 over 6. Next step is to find the LCM of 7, 3, and 6. What we're going to do, we're going to use the division method to do this. So what we do, let's create this table here, and we're going to put the 7. Let's use the smallest number. So we're going to put the smallest number 3, then 6, then 7. And what we're going to do, we're going to divide each of those by the prime factors. Let's start with the prime factor, 3. Okay, look at the number 3. The prime factor of 3 is 3. Because 3 has two factors, 1 and 3. In other words, 1 times 3 gives us 3. But only 3 is a prime number. 1 is not a prime number, since it only has one factor. 3 is a prime number, two factors. So this is called a prime factor, because it's a prime number, and it's also a factor of 3. So we're going to divide by 3. Now 3 into 3 give us 1. 3 into 6 give us 2. Now 3 can enter 7, but we'll have a remainder, so we're going to put back 7. So we will not use 7. All right. So since we have a 1 here, we would not need to use 1. We're going to use 2 in this case. 2 into 1, right? We'll split back the 1 there. 2 times 2 into 2, that gives us 1. Uh, 2 cannot enter into 7 without a remainder. It will give us a remainder, so we back 7. All right, so we're left with just 1, 1, and 7. So we'll use 7. The idea is that we want all 1s in the end. All right, so put about the 1, put about the 1, and 7 into 7 gives us 1. So once we get a 1, we just put them back. All right, so now we're left with all 1s in the end. So what we'll do, these prime factors, we'll just simply multiply them, and that will be the LCM. So it'd be 3 times 2 times 7. 3, 2, 6, and 6, 7, that's 42, and that's the LCM. This is the division method. Now, 7 goes into, what we're going to do now, we're going to divide the LCM by the denominators, and the answers that we get, we'll multiply them by the corresponding numerators. So, 42 divided by 7 will give us 6. In other words, 6, 7 is 42. So, in other words, if we multiply it by 6, we get 42. We multiply this by 6 as well, and that will give us 66. Okay, plus 3 goes into 42. How many times? If we have 42, and we divide by 3. 3 into 3 goes once. 3 into 4, that goes once. Remainder 1. Put 1 by the 2 to give us 12, and 3 into 12 goes 4 times. So we're left with 14. In other words, 3 times 14 is 42. So if you multiply by 14, we get 42. So multiply this by 14 as well. That is the numerator by 14. So that's going to give us 28. Minus, we know 6 times 7 is 42. So it's 11 times 7, that's 77. Okay? This is the same thing as saying 7 to 42 goes 6 times, and 6 times 11 gives us 66. 3 to 42 goes 14 times, 14 times 2 gives us 28. 6 into 42 goes 7 times, and 7 times 11 is 77. Just different approach. Okay, so now what we're going to do now is to add a 66 plus 28. That will give us uh, 94. Let's see. 66 plus 28. 8 plus 6, that's going to be 14. 2 plus 6, 8 plus 1, 9. So that's 94. And then we're going to subtract 77. Because that's what we have here, minus 77. Now, 7 from 4, we can't. We're going to borrow 1 from the 9. Leaves us with 8. The 1 we borrow. Let's put it there. And so 7 from 14. In other words, 14 minus 7, that's 7. And 8 minus 7, that's 1. So we're left with 17. So that's be 17 over 42. And that's our solution. 
All right, so there might be some different little methods that I use, for example, calculating the LCM. And it's a different method. You've probably never seen that before. Um, probably did. However, there are several other ways. And uh, we could also, we could have simply written out the multiples of seven, multiples of three, multiples of six, and then look at the lowest one, the lowest multiple that's common to all three. We'd have gotten 42 the same way. All right, so for the next one, we're asked to write the value of the cube of 27 over nine squared as a fraction in its lowest terms. So how do we do this? What is the cube root of 27? That's the question. What is the cube root of 27? So let's rewrite that. The cube root of 27. So this, sim this symbol here is a radical symbol. All right, so they refer to it as the radical sign root symbol radix or surd and it is a symbol for the square root or higher order root of a number in this case we're talking about cube root since we have a three here okay so in this case it means what number when multiplied by itself three times give us 27. all right so there are several ways we're going to do that we're going to look at how we can um, do that so let's start with 27. what number can enter what's the lowest number that can enter 27. Um, let's use prime factors. Well, let's use three. Two cannot enter 27 without a remainder, so we're gonna use three. Three goes into 27, nine times. Let's use three again. Three goes into nine, three times. And three goes into three once. And of course, if you multiply all these, we end up with three to the third power. Okay? Which means that the cube root of 27 is three since three times three times three gives us 27. So the answer for the top one is three. Now we are gonna divide that by nine squared, which means nine times nine. And of course, we can simplify this. Three into three goes once, three into nine goes three times. And so that will leave us with one over three nines, 27. And so that's the answer as a fraction in its lowest term. Next, the thickness of one sheet of cardboard is given as 485 times 10 to the negative 2 millimeters. Let's write that. Now, a construction worker uses 75 sheets of the cardboard stacked together to insulate a wall. So this is the thickness of one sheet of cardboard. But let's write it as an ordinary number. You know that if we were to multiply just by a positive number, for example, 10 squared is really 100. So 10 to the negative two power, that is really what? That's really one over 100. In other words, one over 10 squared, okay? So what we really have here is 485 times one over 10 squared, which is 485 times one over 100, and so this is going to be really 485 over 100. And if we're dividing by 100, you move the point two places to the left. And so that's going to be 4.85. What's a quick way of doing this? Well, if it's a positive power of 10, we'll move the decimal point to the right. Okay? If it was a positive power of 10, we move the decimal point to the right. So because it is a negative power of 10, we move it two places to the left, one, two. Negative power, we move to the left. Positive power, move to the right. And so that gives us the 4.85. Much faster, right? So this is the thickness of one sheet. So now if we have 75 sheets stacked together, it means, look at it. If we have another sheet, the thickness is gonna be twice this amount, right? If you have three sheets, Gonna be three times this amount. So if 75 sheets, it's gonna be 75 times that amount in millimeters. And that will give us, of course, the answer that they have here. Because we're trying to show that the thickness, um, the exact thickness of insulation is 363.75 millimeters. Of course, use your calculator and check this. Okay. Next. Write the thickness of the insulation correct to two significant figures. So let's rewrite that. 
and re remind us what the thickness is again, 363.75. So it's 363.75 that we want to A, correct to two significant figures. Now, the first significant figure in the number is, if we look at left to right, and the first digit we find that's not zero, that's the first significant. The first significant, this one is our second significant figure. So that's we right up to that part. Now the thing is, we look at place value. Place value is very important in decimal places and significant figures. So place value of the six here is what? If you read this number, it's saying 363.75. So this is 60. The six here is 60, hence we say 63. So since this six is 60, we want to ensure that when we chop off the other digits, we maintain the place value. So it's gonna be three, six. Now this three is in the ones place, but it should be in the tens place. So we put a zero here. Now the question is, should we have round up the six though? Should we have round it up to a seven? No, because the next digit that we check, the first of those we're chopping off is less than five. Since this three, the first of those we're chopping off is less than five, we maintain the six as it is. But remember, we have to add a zero here simply because we want to maintain the place value of the six, which is in the tenths place. In other words, when you look at these two numbers, this is 363.75, this is 360, they are approximately the same value, close, in other words. If you had just simply put 36, it wouldn't have been close to this number. So that's where you know your answer is not correct because we are rounding off, we are approximating, so to speak. So a person may want to know, what if we had something like this? What if we have 363 point, um, let's say 368, right? Let's say we had 368.42 or something. Uh, let's see, 0.4, let's leave it as that. And we want to round this off to two significant figures. This is another example we're looking at here. Two significant figures, this is the first significant figure, second significant figure, so we're gonna chop the rest off. But we always have to look at the first digit we're chopping off. If it's five or more, we add one to the required place. And so that's gonna be three, seven. But look at 37. 37 is that 37 a, a representation of the original number, 368.4? No. So we have to put a zero there because the six that changed to a seven was in the what? Tens place. So the seven must be in the tens place. So that would be 370. And you can see that 370 is very close to 368.4. So that's the idea when they talk about rounding off. We want to make sure the original and the approximated values um, are, are close. Okay, so that's part A. Part B, take the same 363.75, the original answer, and we want to correct it to one decimal place. So to one decimal place, we write Look at the whole number portion, 363, we don't shovel that. Then we go at the required decimal place, which is one. Which digit is in the one decimal place? That is seven. And so we're gonna ask this question, do we add one to it or do we leave it as it is? We're gonna chop off the other digits. Well, the very first digit we're chopping off is in the category of five or more. In fact, it's five. So what do we do? Well, we add one to the previous digit, the last digit, the required decimal place. And so that's going to be 363.8. That's the answer to one decimal place. And this is, let me just write this, two sig fig, right? And the thing is, we don't put a point at the end here. We have to be careful with that. If we had put a point at the end of the 360, then what would happen is that the zero would be significant. So avoid putting a point at the end. Mm, uh, some people might say that's some technical stuff, but um, we don't put a point at the end, okay? Because a zero could be significant. A zero could be, for instance, if we were told to round this off to, well, it depends on what number we had. So if we had something like 440.5, um, right? And we were asked to round this off to three significant figure. Let me use 440 point, um, uh, let's use four, 440.4. And we were asked to round this off to three significant figures. This will be the first, this will be the second, and then this zero would be significant, why? Because it's between two significant figures, the previous four and the four after, so it is significant, all right? And so we'd have four, four, zero, because we'll keep the zero as zero because the next digit is less than five. And so we'll keep this zero, but do you notice that we have a zero at the end, just like in this case, 
So this zero, while it's not significant, this one would be. And so we would need to put a point at the end here to help us to appreciate that. And so in this case, we could, someone could clearly see that that zero is significant. And that's how they actually um, double check that. So that's something you can, you can really note. Okay. All right. So let's look at the next part of the question, which is writing that, writing that same number, the original number, 363.75 in standard form. Now in standard form, you must have a number between one and 10. So A must be greater than one. In other words, one must be less than A, which means A is greater than one. And A must be less than 10. Okay, A is less than 10. So A is greater than one, but less than 10. But A could also be equal to one. All right, so that's what we say A is standard, is part of the standard form process. So A times 10 to the nth power. The n represent the number of places the decimal point will be shifted. Okay, so this is the form that we want, where n is basically an integer. n is a subset, well, n is a member of a set of integers. Correction. All right, and integers, you know, we have negative whole numbers, zero, and positive whole numbers. So, for instance, if I have a, a thousand, and I wanna write that in standard form, what would it be? Bear in mind, we call standard form scientific notation, okay? In some places, they look at the original number like this as the standard form, and what we're converting into, which is this, as the scientific notation, so. But we look at both as the same. This is standard form, this is scientific notation. Now, to convert, an, we're looking at an example here. To convert this into standard form, it's not, because a thousand is not between one and 10. So we look at where the point is, and shift the point put it after the first significant figure, which is after the one, so that we have one here, the point comes after. But do we need to put back these zeros here? No, because they make no sense there. I mean, it doesn't change anything really. Let's keep them there for now. Um, yeah, and they're gonna multiply by 10 to what power? What power of 10 will bring this point back to the end? Well, one, two, three. No, positive three, because we want the point to move back to the end. And so, of course, this is one times 10 to the third power. Now we don't want that, those um, points, those zeros there, so we can take them off. But all we, if, you can, if, you, if you notice what we are doing here is really this, multiplying one by 10 to the third power. 10 to the third power is 10 times 10 times 10, which is a thousand. So it's one times a thousand, which gives us back a thousand. Now hopefully that made sense. All right, and um, what if we had um, some numbers there other than um, zeros? Let's let's put some other digits there other than zeros. Um, so let's use 1200, okay? I wanna convert that into standard form. Again, the point is at the end, so we wanna shift it, place it right after the first significant figure. So we have 1.2, zero, zero, times 10. Now, how many digits do we did we pass? Going to the left, one, two, three. So that's gonna be the third power. Now we want a power of 10 that will carry the point back to the original place, to the right. So it's one, two, three. So it's positive three in other words. But do we need those zeros there at the end? No, so we can remove these last two zeros because it wouldn't change the final answer. If I should multiply 1.2 by 1,000, which is 10 times 10 times 10, I'll shift the point once, that's 12. Another time, that's 120. Another time, that's 1,200, the original. So this will be your answer in standard form. And to, the thing is, when would we get a negative power though? When would we get a negative power? Well, we get a negative power if the original number um, starts with a zero. For instance, let's suppose that we have, let's suppose that we have 0 0.0045. We still want the first part to be a number between one and 10. Could be one, but not 10. So we're gonna shift this point and put it after the first significant figure. So that's become 4.5. Now, these zeros that were there at the beginning, I mean, do we really need them, right? Those should be three zeros there. One second, some technical difficulties. <laughs> All right, so do we need those um, zeros there? Of course not. So let's write that back again. So that's gonna be um, zero, zero, zero. The point goes after the four. 0.5. All right, if you put this in your calculator, it's gonna, I press equal, it's gonna discard 
the first three zeros. So we don't need those there. Still saying 4.5. All right. But we want them back when we multiply by a power of 10. What power of 10 will bring them back? Let's put them back there for just for show for now. Well, when we multiply by a power of 10, we want the point to move back to where it was. But one, two, three places to the left. So we use negative three. Okay, and that will bring it back one, two, three places to the left because we're dividing by 10,000, in other words. Okay, so if you weren't sure what I was saying, if it was 10 to the third power, not 10,000, but 1,000, sorry. 10 to the third power is 1,000. So if it's 10 to the negative third power, then it's 1 over 1,000. Okay, so that's the idea when I said we're dividing by 1,000. Okay, so now you get that, at least most of it, if anything, we can move on to look at the question that we have. All right, you can always check out some other videos on standard form or scientific notation. Okay, so this is the number that we've given. I'm gonna write it in standard form. So what we're gonna do, we're going to ensure that this number is written as a number between one and 10 first off, the first part, A. So we're gonna shift the point put it after the first significant figure. So when we read it, we write the significant figure three first, then point. So we can clearly see the point comes after the first significant figure. Then write the other digits that we have, six, three, seven, five. Then we wanna multiply by a power of 10 that will bring the point back to where it should be. So how many places do we shift the point? Two places. But we need to make sure that it's a positive power so the point can go back to the right it was after the second three and so this will be our solution hopefully that was clear and you can always check some other videos out on this part C we're told that Marco is on vacation in the Caribbean and he changes 4,500 Mexican pesos to Eastern Caribbean dollars he receives 630 Eastern Caribbean dollars for that so we are asked to complete the statement below about the exchange rate. What we're told, one EC dollar is equal to what? Question mark. Mexican pesos. Okay, so we're not sure about that. But what we, we know for a fact, let's look at EC dollars. What we have, we have 630 EC dollars. That is equivalent to 4,500 Mexican pesos. So treat this like an equation. And with conversion, you only divide or multiply. So if we want one EC dollar, we're gonna divide this side by 630. Why is that? Because 630 into itself give us one. That's one EC dollar. I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side as well. Divide by 630. Okay, so we could do the long division with this or short division, but that's gonna take some time. Use your calculator. So 4,500 divided by 630 give us, yeah, some long decimal number. So 7.1428, etc. But since we're dealing with money, we only want what? Two decimal places. So we're going to write up to this point. All right, 7.14. We only need two digits after the point with currency, with money. But we always need to check the very first digit of those that we are cutting off. Because it's not in the category of five or more, we will leave the very last digit that's required as it is. If this digit here was five, six, seven, eight, or nine, then we will add one to the four to make it five. And it would have been $7.15. But since this is less than five, whether it's four, three, two, or one, or zero, our answer is gonna be 7.14. Okay, so we can chop those off. And so, and that's the amount in Mexican pesos. So one easy dollar equals $7.40 Mexican pesos. Uh, let me just repeat it again. One ECD equals 7.14 Mexican pesos. Now, we're asked to factorize the following expression completely. What is factorization? Well, we look at factors of two numbers, three numbers, etc. All right? Like when we did the six, the seven, and the three, you remember that one? Okay, so this is similar. Um, well, with, I think we found the multiples of that, the LCM, but now we're looking at factors. So for example, when we look at the number 12, 
look at the number 12. What are the factors of 12? Well, we can do this. 1 times 12 is 12. Let's try 2. 2 times 6. Do we have any more? 3 times 4. Right? All give us 12. So these are the factors of 12. All right. I like to do it 1, 2, 3, and see. I'll multiply by the other numbers to give us that quantity. No. So these are the factors of 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 12. What are the factors of 4? We have 1 times 4, and we have 2 times 2. And that's about it. Okay? You always check the last two numbers that we're multiplying, the last two factors we're multiplying. If you know between 3 and 4, we have no whole number. Between 2 and 2, we have no whole number, so we stop there. Now, common factor we have. We have 1 is common, and 2 is also common. Oh, look here. 4 is also common. But which one is the highest common? common factor 4 4 is the highest common factor so in a number 12 n squared minus 4 m n if I should select the highest common factor between 12 and 4 I look at the smaller number and ask myself can the smaller number go into the bigger one and if so then it is the highest common factor why because every number is a is the highest common factor of itself like 12 is the highest factor of 12 if you look at these these numbers 12 is the highest one of 12 right 4 is the highest one for 4. However, since 4 is the highest one, if it can go into the next one, then it will end up being the highest common one anyways. So we take out the 4. And we also want to look at the variables that we have. We have n squared and n. So we're going to compare like variables. So we have n squared and n. What n squared means? n squared means n times n. So we have two factors there All right, for n squared. And for n, we can treat it as 1 times n. In fact, we could even look at n squared as 1 times n squared, similar to how we look at 1 times 12 and 1 times 4. So what's the highest common factor? Well, 1 is common, and uh, n is also common, so we're going to select n. n could be any number, right? So n squared, n could be 5, so it's 5 squared and 5. n could be 4, so it's 4 squared and 4 we're comparing. So whatever it is, n will be the common factor. So we select n. So that's the common factor, the highest common factor. But we are factorizing, which means we're going to see what times what will produce the 12n squared minus 4mn. We have the first factor already, which is a monomial, a single term. And now we need the other factor, which will end up being a binomial, two terms. So it's like reversing the distributive law process. Okay, so what we can do to find those factors, we can use division to help us. So we can say, okay, we're going to take the 12n squared. We're going to take the 12n squared. Let me just take these off so you don't get confused. We're going to take each of these original terms and divide by the highest common factor to get the other factor. For instance, when we look at 12, right? 4 being the highest common factor of 12 and 4, right? But this 4 times 3 is what gives us 12. And this 4 times 1 is what gives us 4. So th these other numbers are very important, this 3 and this 1, because when multiply by 4, we get 4. We get the 12 and 4, respectively. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, watch what I'm saying here. 12, 4n times what will give us back this quantity here? Well, to find that out, we can divide 12n squared, which is 12 times n times n. So we use a raised dot to mean multiplication. So raised dot means a multiplication. 12nn or 12n squared over 4n. Divide out the n. Sorry. 4 into 4 goes once. 4 into 12 goes three times. And we're left with 3n in the numerator. So 3n goes here. If you should multiply 4n by 3n, wouldn't you get back 12n squared? Well, 4 times 3 give us 12. n times n give us n squared. Next, we're going to take the other term, which is 4mn, which means 4 times m times n. So we have three factors there. I'm going to divide it by the highest common factor as well, 4n. The n cancel out here, and 4 into self goes once. And we're left with simply m. So we put back the minus and the remaining factor here. In other words, if we were to multiply 4n by m, using distributive law, would have gotten 4mn. Okay, so we're saying if you had 4n times m, you would have gotten 4mn. 
because it simply means 4 times m times n. Alphabetical order, we put the m first. Okay? Of it the other way around wouldn't be wrong, but it's helpful to see how we got back the 4mn. Because 4mn is same as 4nm. The order of the, the, the variables doesn't matter. Best to have them in alphabetical order, nevertheless, to avoid confusion. So that's going to be our solution in factorizing 12n squared minus 4n. Okay, let's look at the b portion now. For the b portion, we're asked to show that x over 1 minus x, all minus 4x, is the same as this expression here. So to show that, what we need to do is to simplify the expression. So that's what they're asking us to do. Basically, to simplify this rational expression here, which is an al algebraic expression. So what we can do, remember to see this as one quantity, as a denominator. And we can put this over 1. So what we need to do is form the LCM. So when we do not know what one of the denominators is because we have a variable, we can just simply multiply the two denominators. In other words, if I had, for instance, 5 over b. This is just an example, okay? Don't get confused. If I have 5 over b, let's say, plus 2 over, um, um, let's use a. The LCM will actually just simply be 5 times a, b times a, which would be a, b. Put them in alphabetical order. Since we do not know what they are, and then we divide the, the LCM AB by each denominator and multiply by the numerator respectively. Okay? So that's what we would have done. If we had a 2 here, then it would have been 2AB. Because 2AB would have been able to be divided by 2B, giving us A. And so multiply 5 by A to get 5A. And the same 2AB again, which is the LCM, would have been able to divide by A. See? And so we get 2B. And then multiply 2 by 2B, which would be 4B. And that would, would have been our answer, since we cannot simplify the numerator. So we're going to do something very similar in regards to that one. So one second. All right, so let's go back to the x over 1 minus x minus 4x. Put it over 1. I'm going to multiply the denominators to treat this as a one quantity. So 1 minus x times 1 is simply 1 minus x. And then what we can do here, um, we can see 1 minus x, which is the LCM, divided by the denominator here, which is 1 minus x. And of course, it goes into itself once. So that 1 times x is just simply x. Then we're going to take the LCM again, which is 1 minus x, and divide it by 1. Of course, that's going to give us 1 minus x. Okay, any quantity divided by 1 gives you back that same quantity. So we're going to take that 1 minus x, all right, and multiply it by 4x. And so what we have here now, what we have here now is, one second, what we have here now is a numerator that needs to be simplified. So what we're going to do, look at what we have in the numerator. We have a bracket with a binomial basically inside, and we need to distribute it, we need to expand the bracket. So we're going to multiply it by exactly what's outside. So it's going to be negative 4x times both terms. So put back the x, put back the denominator. Negative 4x times 1, give us back negative 4x. Negative 4x times negative x, negative 4x multiply by negative x. The negative times negative is going to be positive. All right, when you have, when you're multiplying um, negative numbers, if we have an even amount, it will always be positive. If you have an even amount, 1, 2. So it's going to be positive. And 4 times, this is really negative, 1x. So 4 times 1 is 4. And x times x is simply written as x squared. That's a different way of writing it. So it's going to be positive 4x squared. All right. Now let's simplify this further. If we have 1x minus 4x, the truth is we have like terms here. And 1 minus 4 is really 3. So we have negative, well, 1 minus 4 is negative 3, so they have negative 3x. So this portion here work out to be negative 3x. Those are the like terms. The 4x squared is not a like term with these. We cannot add unlike terms or subtract unlike terms. Once you have a different power, it's, it, we don't have like terms. 
these are the same term, like terms really, because you have x, they are x terms raised to the same power of one. X to the one minus four x to the one, in other words. So they're like terms. Again, this has a different power, so you have to treat it as a different or unlike term, preferably. Then put the four x squared here, put the one minus x. So far, if you notice, what we have here is one minus x. In the denominator, we have one minus x. What we need to do now is to factorize so we end up with the same term. Factoring, factorizing, only x is common between negative three x and four x squared. So we're gonna factor out an x. Again, if you have x, right? If you have x squared and x, um, what's the highest common factor? Well, it'll be x. Because x is, the factors of x are really one and x, because one time x give you x. The factors of x squared will be one times x squared or x times x, right? And the highest one, apart from one, is x. So we factor out x from this. What we have in the bracket? Well, x times what will give you negative three x. If we take negative, if we take the negative three x and divide by x, what would we get? We get negative three. In other words, x times negative three give us back negative three x. And x times what will give us positive four x squared. We take four x squared and divide it by the x that we have here. All right, remember x squared is really x times x. So this x cancel out one of these x's remaining x. That's so all we left back with is 4x. So it's positive 4x. All right? Okay, so if you notice, it's very similar. We have a positive 4x in bracket here, just like we have here, and a minus or minus 3, like a negative 3. So all we need to do is to write back what's outside and reverse the numbers, the terms inside. It's the same thing, really. Addition is commutative. The order of addition doesn't matter, so we can put the 4x first. And the minus 3 or negative 3 after. And we can clearly see that we have the same solution. All right, so the, the explanation was a bit lengthy, but once you understand what you're doing, you can actually make shortcuts. Hopefully that was helpful. All right, so it says hence solve the equation. Okay, so remember that this particular Let's look at it. This particular portion we dealt with already. So let's go back to what we had in the previous. All right. We'd have worked out this, showing that it's actually equal to this. So this is what we're going to do. All right. We have x, open bracket, 4x minus 3 over 1 minus x. The, the point in saying hence is that we're going to use our answer in the previous um, question. We're going to write this as that answer, okay? So remember what we had? Well, we have the x. We had 4x minus 3 over 1 minus x. And we're saying that this rational expression is the same as this one. Rational because we have a fraction, right? Like a ratio. So this one is like is this basically this one. So we just replace it. That's why they say hence, because we wouldn't have to go back through this to simplify this to solve. It's like part has already been done. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, we can actually get rid of this denominator here because we have an equation. Once we have an equation we'll, and we have to solve for the unknown, we want to get rid of the denominator. And we can get rid of the denominator. We're going to treat this as once, one quantity. So we have x, open bracket, 4x minus 3 over 1 minus x equals 0. And what we're going to do to both sides, what we're going to do to both sides is to multiply both sides by the denominator itself. So we're going to actually multiply this by 1 minus x, multiply over here as well by 1 minus x. What we do to one side, we do to the other. So I multiply this left hand side here by 1 minus x. I multiply this right hand side also by 1 minus x. So what that does, it allows me to cancel. In other words, let's look at this example here. If I have one over five um, equals, um, let's say, what's let's use let's use let's use um, two over ten. All right? You know that one two tenth is the same as one fifth because if we divide by two, we get one. If we divide by two, we get five. 
So I can actually I can actually make the equation true. I can keep show that the equation is true. This is just an example, right? I'm gonna get back to this just now. I'm just showing you something. If I multiply this left hand side here by five, which is a denominator that I have, and I multiply the other side by the same five, then this will cancel this, correct? Right? Because one fifth of five is one, right? So that will give us one. And this will also give us one on the, on the right hand side. Let's see. Five goes into self once, five goes into 10 two times, and two divided by two is one. One equals one. So we're showing that it's, it will be correct, all right? So this is a principle I'm using in simplifying this um, rational fraction over here. All right, so let's simplify this. I'm talking about the left hand side here. So this into itself goes once, into itself again goes once, okay? And that will leave me with what? That will leave me with the x, open bracket, 4x minus 3 equal, now 0 times any quantity, so regardless to what this quantity is, when multiplied by 0, we'll get 0. This x times one, another quantity gives me 0. If one number times another number gives me 0, it means that either this number is 0 or this number is 0. So think of it like this way. If I say p times q, is zero, it means p could be zero, right? Because zero times q would be zero. The q could be zero, so p times zero would also be zero. So either number could be zero. So either, so either the x quantity is zero, so that means x is zero, or the four x minus three is equal to zero. Like this quantity works out to be zero. Now, if that's the case. If that's the case, let's take it further. If 4x minus 3 is 0, what is the value of x that made that happen? So I will try to get rid of this minus 3 here. How do we do that? By adding 3 to both sides, okay? So this cancels out. Mm -hmm. Leave me with, this cancels out, leave me with 4x. And this gives me 3. Next, I would want to do what? I want to find x. So I'm going to divide this by 4. Divide this by 4. 24 goes once, and that leaves me with x equals 3 over 4. Okay, so my two values are, because I, I did say x is equal to 0 in one instant. So we have two answers, x equals 0 or x equals 3 quarter. If we should put um, 0 here in the in the solution, let, let's, let's just check. If I were to put these answering. If I put zero here, zero divided by one minus zero. One minus zero is still is one. So zero divided by one is zero. Minus four times zero is zero. So zero minus zero. Give me the solution of zero. So hey, the first part is correct. And if I check the other solution, let's check that one. Let's check in this, you know, we can do that. In your exam though, you don't do that. You just move on to your other questions. But just because we're practicing, we want to see if it makes sense. So x is three over four. In other words, 0.75. Probably can use that. All right, you know, let's use that. Let's use 0.75. It might be easier to work with since we it's an exact number. Um, 0.75. So I'm replacing the x in the numerator by 0.75. Sorry about that. And then 1 minus 0.75 because x is 0.75 minus um, 0.75. Let's see what this will give us. That's 0 0.75, a dollar minus 75 cents is 25 cents, right? All right, and if I have 475 cents, this would be minus. If I have 475 cents, how much do I have? Um, so 75 cents plus 75 cents is dollar 50, so that's $3 basically. All right, so that'd be 3.00. Use a calculator and check that out. Now, how many times 25, this should be, a, yeah, no, that should be, this correct. If I have, um, how many times 25 cents can enter into 75 cents? Three times, right? Right? Yeah. So that's going to be three. So this worked out to be three minus three. Because this is three. Three point zero zero is three. And three minus three is zero. So we see we actually get the zero there. So we know it's correct.
Awesome. All right, so if we said we're told to make V the subject of the formula. So we have P, let's, let's write that. P equals square root of five plus V T, okay. All right, so we want to make V the subject of the formula. We have P being the subject, we have P is, we want to make V the subject. In other words, we want to get what? V is whatever expression. That's what they're telling us, to make V the subject instead of P. All right, so I like to just have it on the side that it's, it's on, uh, like V is on this side, right? So I wanna put it on the left-hand side so I can say V, which is on the left, equal whatever. Not that important though, but. And then next, what we're gonna do, we're gonna get rid of this square. So I'm gonna use, we're gonna get rid of the square root, right, square root rather. And so I use square, which is the reverse of it. And since I, I square that side, I must square the other side too. Now what that, that does is square cancel square root. So that leaves me with five plus VT equals P squared. And th that's always the case, okay? Um, for instance, if you have like, for instance, let's see, um, the square root of 25 is five, right? And both are equal, both sides are equal. You know that, it's just an example, all right? If I square this side and I square this side, the equation still remain true, all right? Because what happens, square root cancel square, our square cancel square root, leaving me with 25. And this side is five squared, which is 25. Remains true. So once I have square root, so all I did was write this on the left-hand side and write this on the right. And then I remove this square root with a square in it, just like I did here, over here, to show you the example. All right, so now we wanna make V the subject. So V is attached to T. Now T is only affecting V. We want to remove the, the quantity that's affecting the, the other terms and symbols. So this five is being added to VT, which is everything else. So we're gonna remove that first. So we're gonna subtract five, I'm gonna subtract five on this side as well. So this leaves me with VT, positive VT that is, equals P squared minus five. Is that, It's as if we move the plus five from here, the positive five over as a minus five in the other, on the other side. Next, I wanna make V the subject as noted before. So T is connected to V by multiplication. So we remove it by division and we do that to both sides. So T cancels out and we are left with V, let's write that in the next step. All right, so this means, implies that. So V is equal to P squared minus V minus five, sorry, all over T. So V is equal to the quantity P squared minus five divided by the quantity T. And that's our solution.